terms of my experiences coming into this, I grew up in a very small town in northwestern New South Wales, and it was an Aboriginal community. It has about 750 people. And um, I was privileged enough to attend a school in Sydney. I never studied anything to do with Aboriginal history whatsoever. I remember history at school being about the gold fields and about um, Burke and Wills and, the settler and the, the, how we, Australia was settled. And there was no mention of Aboriginal, even the presence of Aboriginals here, uh, until actually I got to high school. And I'll get to that in a sec, but in primary school there was just nothing. It was just, an, it was just absent. I learned about gold fields, like I said, um, Burke and Wills. That pretty much characterises my whole, my whole primary school. And every time I would go back home in the holidays to visit my family, there'd be one less, um, one less of my friends there. I'd say, oh, where's so-and-so? And they'd say, oh, he got sent. I said, what, what does this he got sent mean? And it turns out he would end up um, slowly, slowly, all my friends were going into the criminal justice system, either into juvenile detention or as when they turned 18, they would go into a term of full-time imprisonment. So uh, slowly I started to think, well, something's wrong. Something, how can people, when I go back home, just suddenly disappear? What's happened? And that was really my introduction because as I started to ask questions, I was taken under, um, under the wing of a few Indigenous elders, Aboriginal elders there, and they were very, 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 very kind with their time and their knowledge. And I was absolutely blown away when they started telling me about the local history. So not even about what happened in Australia, but local history. So what happened in that area? And I was shocked because I never, I never knew that there were massacres down near the creek. I never knew that there was exploit, uh, sexual exploitation. I never knew that there was an issue with uh, stolen wages as they just used to take um, Aboriginal men to be um, working on the farms but not pay them. I, I had no idea. I was, it, was, it was such a learning curve for me because I thought, how, how, could this ha how could this be going on? But no one's talking about it. So we get to this idea about it just being completely silent. And if it wasn't for those um, very generous people in that community, opening up my eyes a little bit, I would probably be none the wiser today. So that, that was my own experience. Also, my mum came here as a refugee from Italy after World War II. And it's interesting because you would expect her to have a certain um, respect or affiliation with, with refugees who come here on boat, as, she, as did she. But she's adamant that she came the right way. Uh, so we have a lot of interesting conversations in our family uh, and she's slowly coming around. But it's interesting because growing up I didn't want to, I didn't, my husband's shaking his head at the back. <laughs> we live in hope that she's coming around. Um, but it's interesting because growing up I remember in primary school, the, the first time I, I, and I didn't really recognise this as racism, and this is just superficial racism, where I remember Everyone was teasing me because I would have funny food at school and it's, it's funny how kids, and they were like, oh, what is that? And they would tease me. And I remember going home being really angry with my family that we were different. And I was angry because at the time my parents weren't very uh, well off and I was angry that I couldn't look like the girls at school, I couldn't wear what they were wearing and I really hated my family for it. And again, I was only in primary school so I was obviously internalising a lot of the stuff that was going on around me and that was really my only way of acting out was just to say to my parents, like, I hate you, why can't you do this, why can't you do, do that? I remember being really angry at my, my nunna, my grandmother, because she didn't speak English and she'd been here 40 odd years she didn't speak English, I didn't speak Italian, I, and my parents tried to make me um, learn Italian. I was like, I don't want to learn Italian, I live in Australia, you should learn how to speak English. So, I actually wasn't very nice, I don't think, growing up. Um, <laughs> but this whole idea about being really resentful that my grandmother couldn't speak English, and um, I, I, I mean, I didn't understand the politics of this, but she was a migrant woman, she came out here, um, she married my grandfather, his second wife to help look after the children because my uh, um, my real my real grandmother passed away from cancer. Uh, they couldn't afford medical treatment or anything back then, so she um, she didn't really have any chances. And I just remember being really angry. I didn't understand that when migrant women ca women came out here, they didn't really um, they weren't employed. They just stayed at the home. They had very traditional roles. They they didn't. Um, is completely different now in some respects. So I didn't understand any of that, but I went through that experience and then open it, opening up my eyes and seeing that, holy moly, we live in a country that is inherently has its foundations in racism, that really set me off on a course. 
And it wasn't until I was at university, I'd never met a Muslim person, um, but I was at uni and the September 11 had happened. And I remember thinking, oh my God, these Muslims are so violent. Why do they want to kill us? Where does it say in their book that they have to kill all the infidels and the kafirs? Like, what is this backward religion? I didn't ha know any Muslims, but it didn't stop me from having very strong opinions about Islam or Muslims. And I remember thinking that everyone who wore a scarf was oppressed, was um, stupid, was uneducated, that I, I honestly thought they needed to be liberated, uh, that they were probably wearing that because they were forced. I mean, I had ridiculous views. And like I said, I didn't know a Muslim. I didn't know anything about Islam, but I had very strong opinions about it. And it wasn't until I went to the mosque because I wanted them to confirm what I thought I knew, which was that Islam was inherently violent. I thought this guy called Allah, this God they believe in, was just this awful, why, why would anyone believe in him? I came from a, a Christian upbringing, uh, even though we weren't really practicing, where God was merciful and kind. But then I started learning about all the missionaries and what they did to the Aboriginal people. So I was having a lot of, a lot of um, unreconciled questions going on in my mind. And when I went to the mosque, obviously, that led me on to my path of, of converting. But I had actually, uh, look, until that year six experience, because I went to school with mortadella on a sandwich, I'd never actually experienced racism. Like racism where it, racism, which is more than just superficial passing remark, your sandwich smells funny kind of racism. And it's when I put the scarf on, because suddenly, I think my whiteness became invisible. So it's, when I say that, I mean that when people looked at me, I didn't look white, even though I am white, I identify as being Anglo-Saxon, notwithstanding my mum's heritage. Um, I, it's, my whiteness was invisible. And I found to a certain degree that the privilege that comes along with being white was decreased. And I was in for a very rude shock. <laughs> nothing nothing um, prepares you for losing your privilege, I tell you what. Um, to be honest with you. But when Uncle Ken was talking about how it's so important to build connections, we, he, we were recently very graced with his, with his um, he came out to Lakemba and I wasn't there, I was so upset but I had to babysit. But my husband was there as well as a number of colleagues. And there was a sheikh that we had out, a mom from the US called Imam Zaid that came out and met Uncle Ken and Uncle Ken and um, uh, Imam Zaid shared a number of stories and I've, I've heard that the similarities between the two struggles, if you like, were, were quite interesting. There was a lot of parallels. And I think it's really important to think that, and I'll never forget this, Uncle Ken, this wasn't the first time you said this tonight. You, uh, first time I heard you say this about being demonised and then becoming invisible, I think was at one of the rallies that we attended earlier in the year. And I'll never forget it because Uncle Ken said, he said, don't let them demonise you. Because if you let them demonise you, you become invisible. And when you become invisible, they get to do whatever they like to you. And that stuck with me. And I went back to my community and I said, this is what, this is what we've, we've just been told. What can we take away from, from that? And out of that, we've made a commitment to hopefully keep engaging with the Aboriginal community, the local Aboriginal community as well. And we have a lot to learn. And so I'm incredibly grateful that um, it, people like Uncle Ken are able to share their knowledge with us and we really do appreciate it, so thank you. Um, in terms of Islamophobia, we have to get past the understanding that it's not just the smelly sandwich remarks, it's not just saying go back to where you ca came from, it's not saying, um, oh, I'm concerned about Sharia, it's, it's not this type, that's a manifestation. So when someone's attacked or verbally abused or sent death threats, um, that's a manifestation of Islamophobia. But Islamophobia, going back to what's already been dis discussed, it's tied in with this structural idea of, of power and, and of inherent racism as well. Um, we've seen Islamophobia more from, for example, the Cronulla riots where we, had, uh, we saw people wearing the ethnic cleansing unit t-shirts and it was almost like mob violence. But it was interesting because what came out of Cronulla was that that behaviour was not excused for, but there was an idea that alcohol played a role in that, in that mob violence, which is interesting. So this, alco this idea of alcohol was almost seen as um, maybe that's why they did it. Or, but, but also remember the, the Lebanese boys, they go out there and they perv on the girls. Okay, that was also an excuse for, for mob violence as well. So we've seen this idea that um, it's, it's a shambolic, drunken, 
mob violence mentality, that's a manifestation of Islamophobia. We've seen that morph into now being an incredibly organised, well-funded um, organisations and they reference the Quran, they reference Hadith, so it's incredibly difficult to counter that where on the face they seem to be um, a legitimate, uh, legitimate, which is they're not illegitimate, but legitimate in the eyes of perhaps the wider Australian and international community as well. Now in regards to the Paris tragedy, the Islamophobia Register, we've just released a preliminary report over the 12 months of data that we've received, and we're hoping to issue a final report later, later early next year. And that re some of the results from the data, from the, um, the analysing of that data, was that directly after the Paris attacks, we received an increase of threefold in terms of people reporting either physical violence, online death threats, online harassment and intimidation, and uh, as well as online hate as well. So what we've noticed is that, and I wish I had the graph up, because those who came to the earlier session would understand what I'm talking about, but the way that we speak about issues such as national security, um, welfare, racism, when a tragedy strikes, for example, the Paris uh, tragedy in Beirut, but anyway, um, and a few others that weren't even mentioned, but the graph actually showed a spike in reports. So the idea that a few privileged people can discuss, discuss an issue, very sensitive issues in Parliament without any regard whatsoever as to how that rhetoric filters down into homes and to the, the streets, is, in, is incredibly concerning because, again, directly after Paris, we saw a threefold increase in reports to the, to the register. So there was an increase. After the burqa ban, the ve when that was discussed here, very next um, morning, eight, eight attacks against Muslim women. And this is the issue. With reports to the Islamophobia register, the people who do report it, mostly women, these um, incidents largely happen in public spaces largely with uh, pr children present, whether it's the children of the victim or the children of the perpetrator. So we need to start thinking as well, and I mentioned this in my earlier session, what type of seeds are we sowing for the future generations if they're seeing this level of racism play out? And this isn't just um, small exchanges on the street. This is actually from a political level, a system down level, where we're seeing it all interact and come into the melting point. We've seen Muslims become, especially Muslim women, and I wish I had it up, but we've seen Muslim women cop it from both ends, meaning in the, in the broader Australian community, so the non-Muslim community, we're being seen as being facilitators of terrorism, especially those women who choose to wear the niqab. So in other words, we're being seen as being able at a drop out of a hat just to turn violent. Um, I'm not sure if our husbands would, would agree with that or not, but uh, that was a dad joke. <laughs> but essentially we're being... Um, seen as being facilitators of terrorism or facilitators of violence and it's almost even the, the role of our mo of motherhood has been corrupted i mean there's one very um, famous article that i quote often and it essentially references us from i think it says um baby or uh, womb jihad or something like that so essentially it's saying that we're able to be just produce reproduce because that's all our role is in islam apparently is just to produce children um which it's not but producing children just for the sake of jihad, which of course is rubbish, but it's a very powerful piece of rhetoric to counter when you add, 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 add on top of that, on top of that. And in my, la in my earlier session, I just had a few instances and examples of just the media portrayal of Muslim women. So on one hand, we've got the fact that we're scary people, especially if we wear a niqab, and on the other, uh, other side of things, we're being seen as the oppressed um, Muslim women uh, without a voice, um, chained to the bed or to the kitchen, depending on the whims of our husbands, um, you know, incredibly uh, illiterate, unable to participate, we don't speak English very well, and all of those types of, um, those types of examples. We've had even the food that we eat become politicised, so we had the inquiry into halal food, what a waste of money. Um, we've seen, we're seeing places of worship and even the food that we eat fall under suspicion, for example, is this somehow scary? Is it somehow? Is it, would this lead to violence? We don't know what's going on. We don't know what they eat, how they eat it, where does the money go? Um, what happens in mosques? Maybe mosques are the problem. It's these backyard shakes and things like that. It goes on and on and on. So um, it's a really interesting examination of what Islam Islamophobia is in the last 12 months. And Randa Abdel Fattah actually said, and I'd like to read this definition that she 
um, has put out. She says, Islamoph Islamophobia is fundamentally a story. It's a transnational epic narrative translated into multiple, multiple languages structured around historically honed folk summaries and casts of heroes and villains. It is staged in multiple settings. A desert in the Middle East, a so-called Muslim ghetto in the Western, in, in a Western suburbs. For example, if you remember when apparently all those um, jihadi hotspots in the Western Sydney came up on the news, remember? Does anyone remember this? And people were saying, well, should that really be on the TV? I'm not sure if that's sensitive information or not. But anyway, it was predominantly Muslim areas that were put up. Um, it draws on uh, familiar, historically cultivated motifs. So the belly dances, the harams, the veil, a minaret, more recently, uh, very violent YouTube clips. And she says it's almost like a choose your own adventure book where the plot allows for the narrator to present the audience with the opportunity to choose alternative scenes and genres. So for romance, you turn to jihadi brides, which has been a really interesting way that Muslim women have been represented. So again, we're somehow both become sexualized um, which often happens with the portrayal of Muslim women. We become sexualised, but we're also somehow facilitators of violence and um, conduits of violence as well. Um, or you could turn to page 50, for example, if you want to, um, to, to go to horror, the horror genre. You could YouTube some ISIS beheading videos, for example. Um, but this idea that the Reclaim Australia movement are just a mums and dads uh, movement, which uh, thanks to a recent broadcasting, I think really um, influenced the Australian public in thinking they're just mums and dads who are concerned about our country. We've got to get the eye over the idea that that's what that movement represents. Because as both speakers have said before me, it's, uh, it's, it's far more deeply ingrained than that. This is just one little slither of how it's man manifesting. So in terms of... Um, some of the issues that we're facing, I think it's really important that I just clarify it's not a clash of civilizations whatsoever. And it gets sold as being a clash of civilizations because going back to what um, Peter said, it's being sold as a clash of civilizations because, frankly, it allows the West to say we're superior and our values are superior. And that allows us to then um, ignore any type of critical thinking or criticisms that come from Muslim people, Muslim um, writers, Muslim academics, Muslim politicians, or organically the grassroots Muslim community. And I just wanted to finish with an analogy that um, one of the speakers alluded to. And again, this is from Randa. She's amazing, that's why I'm quoting her a lot tonight. But she says here that, I was at a friend's wedding and the father of the bride stood up to deliver a stock standard speech in which, in which he recited the, I've not lo lost a daughter, I've gained a son. Then addressing the groom, he declared, you have now joined this family. I wondered how many father-in-laws had said this before and what they really meant. By joining the family, was, he, was the son-in-law in the family or of the family? And the distinction is important. To be in the family might mean biting one's tongue during family discussions for fear of offending the in-laws, avoiding controversial topics of conversation, concealing your true feelings on any given topic. It might mean modifying one's behaviour in order to fit into, family, um, into your family. Or does it mean that you're able to argue, you're able to express your, yourself freely without consequence? Does it mean that you're able to criticise the family's members, the dynamics, the values and the norms without censorship? They do not act and are not expected to act as though their sense of belonging is contingent on the family's goodwill. They are free to be themselves, to probe, to challenge, to provoke, to contribute and change, rather than be somebody whose membership merely positions them in the family unit. Time after time, the public debates about Muslims expose this in and of binary positioning of Muslims in Australian society. Like a son-in-law who finds himself on the wrong side of his in-laws when he dares to really express what he thinks at the dinner table. Muslims who dare to presume not only that they are part of Australian society, but that their membership entitles them to be part of the conversation about how this society should take shape, can face fierce opposition and demonisation. What happened to the Mufti is a prime example of this. 
He had strayed from the sanctioned topics of conversation and tread into territory reserved only for those who belong to the nuclear unit, and that is criticising foreign policy or trying to address some of the issues of violence going on around the world. The racial logic that gives people a sense of entitlement to organise Muslims into an in of mode of belonging is based on what scholars have called epistemic racism. Simply put, this form of racism means the West can ignore the critical thinking produced by Muslim thinkers. It deems such interventions as inferior and backward in comparison to the enlightened liberal West. Even when we criticise consultations, which is uh, what I've been very vocal about in terms of participating in consultations where we're really only consulted by the Australian government um, by way of um, rubber stamping, a rubber stamping exercise. And I, again, I think we've had some parallels and some discussions about this. Um, we are heavily criticised for it. We're heavily criticised in, in the broader Australian public who essentially tell us that we should be grateful to have a seat at the table. I'm not grateful. Quite frankly, yeah, I should be at the table. I wouldn't expect anything less. And I think that that kind of attitude that we're seeing in the youth as well is, is really frustrating for the powers to be. But in terms of being a Muslim woman, I just want to say that it also is a two-edged sword because we do cop flack in our own community as well. Uh, and that comes in various forms. But in terms of when you're an advocate in the Muslim community space, uh, Islamophobia plays out in a number of uh, very different ways than if I was just a man presenting on Islamophobia as well. So that's it. I'll stop talking. <laughs>